As dawn breaks over Johannesburg, the busiest city center in Africa hums to life as hundreds and thousands of South Africans stream into the city to chase their piece of the golden dream. Thanks to a vibrant revitalization effort over the past couple of years, the Johannesburg CBD is the vital center of life for the many who study, work, and play there. And now, Clinix's first day hospital is right in the heart of the CBD to help sustain and enhance that life. So Clinix has got the longest history in the country of providing a platform for black professionals in particular to be able to deliver care in the private sector and uh, our one of our oldest uh, hospitals in the group, uh, Dr. S.K. Matseke, has been doing this since 1985 and uh, we have got uh, great experience and we have got a large uh, network of uh, specialists across uh, our facilities who are highly skilled uh, in the different uh, disciplines of, uh, of medicine. We are really uh, in a very good position to be able to make those uh, skills and expertise available to the communities and uh, the people who work and live in and around the job CBD. For more than 30 years, the clinics group has been striving to identify opportunities and meaningful ways to pay tribute to our founding fathers who epitomized the concept of black excellence from the start. And it is in tribute to these visionaries that this hospital is named after the astute businessman and legal expert, Dr. G.M. Bigir. Dr. Pitcher was, uh, to me, he was, he was very, very special. Uh, from the home front, uh, he was my father's best friend. And uh, there would never be any important uh, occasion happening at home without uh, Dr. B.J. being there. So he's always been there. Uh, at, at some stage in my life, I went through difficult times. He was there for me. And when I went through my difficult times, we were there to listen to me. When he went through his difficult times, when he had cancer, I was there to him. So I have got that special relationship with him. He, he's, a, he's a community leader to me. He's my father to me. He's, he's everything. The founding fathers, like him, is Dr. P.J., but actually he was a lawyer, okay? Dr. Tato Matlala was a doctor, but a businessman. Dr. Mukhesi was a doctor, visionary, a businessman as well. In, what, in whatever they did, they were quite diverse. Possibly, if you look into his contribution in law, you'll find that it's major. He was the first president of, of a Black Lawyers Association. If you went into education, you will find that he also features in education. So they, they, were, they were a special breed of people that worked across their disciplines. The Dr. G. M. Bigge Day Hospital at 56 Von Villach Street in the heart of Joburg offers healthcare services in dentistry, dermatology, optometry, ophthalmology, physiotherapy, audiology, ear, nose and throat surgery, orthopedics, gynecology, pediatrics, maxillofacial surgery, as well as general elective surgery. The 36 beds in the state-of-the-art wards and private rooms provide a safe and comfortable space for patients to recover from same-day surgeries under expert supervision. 
The facility also offers doctor suites for consultations with GPs and specialists for all who work and live in the city. For the convenience of all its patients, the Dr. G. M. Bikie Day Hospital offers safe and the use of a courtesy shuttle service for patients who need to be transported between other clinics facilities. You know, the business of clinics has always been to take care of the previously, historically underprivileged uh, people. And uh, we know that uh, our city centers are full of such people. Our city centers are now full of people from outside our borders, uh, from uh, the, the, the Africa, the north of, uh, of where we are. And um, those people have not have had that, uh, they, they haven't had that, uh, the privilege of having the facility like the clinics, the hospital uh, that is coming up now. So this is going to be a fantastic uh, service for, for all of them. And uh, we hope that um, the people will uh, see the advantage of, uh, uh, you know, being serviced close to their, where they are. I think that's the whole idea of clinics, to serve people closest to where they live. It is this ethos of excellence that provides a haven of health care for the denizens of Africa's busiest city. The Dr. G. M. B. K. Day Hospital at 56 von Bullock Street in the heart of Jersey is open to all every day of the week from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. and welcomes all medical aids. And it serves as a fitting memorial to a remarkable man who dedicated his life to excellence. Good evening, colleagues, and um, once more, welcome to uh, the next uh, Health Group's uh, weekly webinars. It's an exciting week for us every time when we meet to chat about uh, matters that affect healthcare and medical education as we bring you experts in their various fields to come and share their knowledge, wisdom, and experience about what they do and love uh, the most. And so this evening, it's one of those evenings when we, when we do so. Uh, we just want to remind you that this are uh, CPD accredited uh, webinars uh, that are hosted by Clinics Health Group and they are also recorded live on YouTube so that um, when you have time to listen or watch these um, videos or the, the presentations, you may do so at leisure, at home, or wherever you find time and place to, to go back through the, and, and, and check the videos or the presentations. So we've done that because we, we've noticed that quite a number of people want to look at the presentations. Uh, doing so, we are not able to send you the presentations unless if the speakers um, agree to sending you the presentations, but you've got access to them on YouTube now. And so this evening, as a reminder, that as you log in, you should do what, uh, just mute yourself immediately as you log in. Make sure that before you log in, uh, you muted your, yourself, you've switched off your video, and also that uh, you've submitted all your CPD, I mean, your, your details for CPD purposes, your name, surname, uh, your registration number for the data body that you're registered with, so that we then may be able to send this to you the following day. For those who are with the HPCSA, you don't have to do anything, just make sure that you see when you register, you provide us with your full details. Uh, you'll get your, uh, your certificate uploaded. I hope that you all get the messages to indicate that you've been, um, you've been registered and uh, that you've got your CPD points. So this evening is it's exciting. I also see that uh, there's one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Mongandim Tembu, who says, good evening, colleagues, the presenter is my best friend. So Dr. Nevada, Dr. Mtembu is here to, to listen to you. So at least if you don't know anybody here, at least you know Dr. Mtembu. Uh, and thank you very much and welcome, colleagues. As Dr. Mtembu has already uh, indicated, we, we have a friend who's going to be talking to us, uh, Dr. Uh, Linda Lanin Nevondo is not a stranger to us. He's done presentations before 
uh, Dr. Lindelano uh, Nevonde is an orthopedic surgeon, currently practicing at one of our hospitals, can be formed a group uh, of uh, orthopedic surgeons. Um, at, uh, he's currently at private Mutselong MP in private hospital. He's also a member of the South African Orthopedics Association or SOA. Uh, Dr. Nevondo obtained his Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery degree, MSH, in 2008, which is quite some time ago, from the University of Pretoria. And then he did a fellowship in orthopedics and obtained his qualification from the College of Orthopedic Surgeons, uh, part of the uh, College of Medicine of South Africa in 2018. Uh, and he's also an MMED uh, in orthopedics from Sifako, Swakmakha to the uh, University of Health Sciences. Uh, that was in 2019. So it's a great pleasure, Doc, to, to welcome you once more. Uh, as we when we were talking the, earlier on, uh, we'll always uh, make a plan that we will invite you again uh, so that we, we will get some knowledge from you and share your, your wisdom. And so, Dr. Nevonda, this evening we'll be speaking about shoulder dislocations. It's quite a, a common uh, ailment uh, in general that we have in also in private practice. We hope that our colleagues, uh, I mean, in, in GP practice, our colleagues will be able to learn from you, I'm sure, learn techniques of how to manage this condition when it presents itself in our rooms. And thanks a lot for accepting this invitation, Dr. Nevond. You're welcome. Hey, Dr. Nevondo. Uh, Zuki, do we still have Dr. Nevondo? No, we don't. I, I can't we see him. him. Yes, I think we've Oh, lost sorry, him. yes. Yeah, and the load shedding so. does the unexpected to us. He was here, colleagues. We, we did everything, tested, saw his presentations. I hope he's not having Lord Chedi, is he connecting from the hospital? Uh, I'm not sure, but he's, he's logging on now. Oh, there he is, yeah, there he is, yeah. So he'll be with us just in a few minutes, uh, just some patients, colleagues, and Dr. Nebwanda will be joining us uh, quite soon. This load shedding is, is, is it's, it's quite just uh, the many activities that we have in our country. And I suppose so, that's what it, it must have been a victim of load shedding. Yes, Dr. Nevoda, you're, you're back online with us. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you're able to connect. Uh, are you fine? I, I, can you hear me? Hello. I can hear you. Uh, we've done all the necessary uh, housekeeping matters and introductions. We've, we've introduced it already. So if you are able to share your screen now, you may please do so. Yeah, thanks. It's coming up. Mm, I think the screen is up. Yeah, it's oh. coming. It's, it's 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 coming. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. All right. Uh, I won't have my phone with me this time. Uh, no, that's one we understand. Yeah. Well, Dr. Timbo knows you, so we can vouch it's you. <laughs> yes, I can vouch. I know Bongani Timbo too. Okay, uh, without further ado, I think I will start. Uh, first, uh, thank you, Dr. Bila and the team for giving me this opportunity to present uh, on this uh, big group, which is actually growing quite massively every week. And I am Dr. Lindelani Nevondo. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, as he has already said everything. So I actually, I'm going to be presenting 
on shoulder dislocation. Uh, the reason for presenting on shoulder dislocation is because it's it's one of those conditions that almost all doctors are going to meet up with, especially if you're a GP working in a practice or you're a first line a medical doctor, you will be presented with a patient with shoulder dislocation. That's pretty much guaranteed. Next slide. Okay, so a few things that I'm going to cover on this. I'll, I'll introduce the topic and I will define it. And I will go through some anatomy that is related to uh, shoulder and shoulder dislocation. And then uh, I'll be talking about how common the disease is and where to find it. And I'll also talk, talk about the mechanism of injury on how it's what causes the condition and uh, I'll classify it, give you a bit of clinical around it, and then we investigate and manage it. Okay, so why shoulder? Because the shoulder itself, it's a very, it's a highly mobile joint. Uh, usually it is compared to the hip joint. The hip joint is a very stable joint, which sacrifices uh, stability which sacrifices motion for stability. Whereas the shoulder is the opposite. It's a very mobile joint which sacrifices stability for mobility. So this stability thing about the shoulder leads to the shoulder having, being exposed to dislocations far more than any other joint. So dislocations are very common. The commonest type of dislocation in the shoulder, it's anterior dislocation and then which is up around 95% of all dislocation and then posterior dislocation at 4%. Dislocation are very disabling and they are very painful. And there's been many cases of people getting shoulder dislocation. We have had uh, Ramos pulling Mosala into an anterior shoulder dislocation uh, and some rugby players and many, many, many people have uh, suffered shoulder dislocation. So when you talk of a shoulder dislocation, it's actually talking about essentially two, the articulation between two bones, which will be your glen, glenoid fossa and the head of the humerus. Once that articulation is lost totally, then it's a dislocation. That's a description from Medisnet on the internet and also from script.com. So in terms of the anatomy related to the shoulder, you you have your humeral head or you have your humerus, which start at the elbow going up to the shoulder. And then when you get there, it's got a humeral head and a anatomical and a surgical neck. And then there's the articular part of the humeral head itself. And that articular part goes and articulate with the scapula, but not the whole of the scapula. It articulate with the glenoid fossa of the scapula. Now, one thing to notice about the glenoid fossa scapula is it's quite shallow. It's not a big joint. And the head of humerus is quite big. So you have this big head that is articulating on a very small glenoid fossa. Hence, it's susceptible to dislocations. Just talking of the scapula bone itself, these are a few views or three views of the scapula that you can see on this. And you can see that on the posterior, it has a spine, there's a spine which end up as an acromion. And then you also have a caracoid process anterior to that. And then uh, you can see the glenoid fossa on, on the two views that are there. And when you look at it, it's a shallow thing. So to increase the depth of, the shell of that uh, glenoid fossa, there's a labrum that there. But uh, talking about the humerals now, a, when you look at the humerus, there's the part that articulate, which is covered by cartilage. And then you have all these uh, ridges that you see on the greater tubercle of the humerus. Those ridges is where the muscles attach. Those will be the rotator cuff muscles, which are responsible for keeping the humerus head articulating with the glenoid. And uh, in terms of those rotator cuff muscles, which are quite important in keeping the humeral head articulated to the 
uh, glenoid, the, those rotator cuff, they maintain that the stability of that joint. They actually call this the dynamic stabilizers. So they originate from the scapular side and they set on the humerus head. It's on those uh, ridges that I was showing just now. And here is how they look like. So if you look uh, from an anterior, so that's when you're looking at the scapula from anterior and you and the humerus from anterior, the muscle that you will find on the inside of your scapula is called your subscapularis. Then when you look superior to that, you will see a supraspinatus. But if you actually turn and look at the back of the humerus, then you will see the spine of the scapula. Below the spine, you find the infraspinatus. Above, you find the supraspinatus. And you can see the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and also the teres minor muscle, they all insert on the greater tuber tuberosity of the of the humeral head. And uh, this used to be a favorite question when we were still in varsity, where they ask you to, to actually know all these muscles, all four of them, you know, their origin, their insertion, their nerve uh, supply, and what to, what they do. So that's the supraspinatus. But when you look at it, you can see the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor. They all insert on the greater tuberosity with the supraspinatus superior, and then middle is the greater tuberosity. Yeah, middle is this infraspinatus and the teres minor on the inferior. And uh, when you look at the nerve, sub nerve supply, the two nerves that you need to know that supply the rotator cuff is your suprascapular nerve, which supplies your supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and subscapularis. Then the other nerve is your axillary nerve. There are other nerves that you need to know, but they don't supply the rotator cuff per se, but they supply the other muscles around the shoulder. And when you look at a uh, motion of the, or action, a motion of the caused by the rotator cuff on the uh, humerus or on the arm, you have external rotation and stability, which is mostly offered by the teres minor and the infraspinatus. Those are the muscles below the spinal scapula. And then you have your supraspinatus, which lift the, which start the initiation of your abduction of your arm. And then your internal rotation will be done by your subscapularis. And then there are also ligaments that start on the scapula side, ending on the humeral side, and they actually stabilize the joint. You also have other ligaments like your long head of your biceps, trichae, which goes from the arm going all the way across in the joint and inserting on the scapular side. So all this stabilizes the shoulder joint. And then in terms of nerve supply, the important nerve to, to remember is your subscapular nerve and your axillary nerve especially your axillary nerve in terms of uh, shoulder dislocation, because when the shoulder dislocates, especially an anterior dislocation, it actually goes and it can injure the axillary nerve itself. In terms of uh, the blood supply of the shoulder joint, the humerus or the humeral head, it's supplied by the, first the blood come from the axillary artery, and then there's the anterior and the posterior circumflex uh, humeral artery, which will supply the humeral head. And then you also have the circumflex scapular artery, which will make anastomosis around the scapula, supplying the scapular body plastic glenoid. So why is this anatomy important? Because you have to remember. <laughs> So you have to remember with uh, your shoulder, it's it's inherently an unstable joint which dislocate easily. So you have to remember most of the stabilizers of it and you can divide them into static and dynamic. Those that don't move or don't have the ability to move, they can be moved by other stuff. It's things like your clinic concavity. There's a negative suction pressure that you find inside the joint. And then you have your labrum, your capsule, and the ligaments around the shoulder joint. Those stabilizes the shoulder. 
And then you also have your dynamic shoulder stabilizers. Those are things that stabilizes and also move the humeral head. That would be your four rotator calf muscles, your deltoid and your biceps and your brachialis, so it's all those. Uh, brachioradialis. Okay, so that's just a diagram showing the humeral head wants to stay on the glenoid and those uh, or those um, it stabilizes, they stabilize the humerus, humeral head on the glenoid neck. So the aim is to keep the humeral head in the glenoid. So this uh, shoulder dislocation condition is quite common. Of all the dislocation that happen in the body, 50% of them, 50% of the major dislocation are usually in the shoulder. And of the sh shoulder dislocation, almost 95% of it, it's usually unilateral shoulder dislocation. Second common uh, dislocation type is a posterior dislocation where the head moves posterior. That's about 4% of all the cases of dislocations. And the thing about the posterior dislocation, because the, the clinical picture and the x-ray can be misleading or can be subtle, 50% of them are missed when they are seen in casualty. So you need to have under a higher index of suspicion and you need to look at the opposite shoulder to compare. Because anyway, on, on, on all in all, bilateral dislocation, whether it's anterior or posterior, they are very rare. And usually those happen in patients who have had uh, epileptic feats or patients who were electrocuted or those who were involved in ECT therapy. And uh, if you get your first dislocation before the age of 20, there's an 80 to 92% chance that it will reoccur. If the first dislocation happened after 40 years of age, the reoccurrence rate reduced and it goes down to about 10 to 15%. Inferior dislocation, which is called subglenoid or erectile laxio, it's kind of rare. It's just like less than 1% of all dislocations of the shoulder. So in terms of mechanism of injury, uh, dislocation happen when the forces keeping the humeral head in the glenoid fossa are overcome. Now the humeral head is allowed to move away from the glenoid fossa. And the cause can be trauma, car accidents being one of the top leading thing, uh, causes, but falls, especially in military uh, areas and people who are playing contact sports is quite common, but there are also non-trauma causes like electrocution, uh, electroconvulsive therapy, and things like seizures in patients with epilepsy that can cause uh, dislocations. And then there's also patients who have been operated in the shoulder for one reason or another. And in the end, the dynamics of the shoulder is affected and the biomechanism is also affected and they end up with dislocations. Or patients who were being treated with electroconvulsive therapy, they can be they can end up with a uh, dislocation. Majority of the causes, especially for posterior dislocation, the cause is usually not known. In some cases, they say you can have my, my, micro trauma, which can end up leading to dislocation. So in terms of causes of anterior dislocation, it's usually when you have a, a force that is directed on back of the arm, which is abducted and externally rotated. Like uh, the picture of Mosala there that you can see. And then in terms of posterior dislocation, it commonly happens when the shoulder is, or the arm is flexed, it's adducted and internal rotation. More like when you're doing push-ups, sometimes you end up with a posterior dislocation. Now this is also common in falls because when you fall and you fall on your elbows, you might end up with a posterior shoulder dislocation. 
And how do we classify shoulder dislocation? There is number of classification that one can use. You can start with a, whether it's an acute dislocation, which happened within the last three weeks, within three weeks, or is it a chronic, which is more than three weeks? Then you can say, is it a complex or is it a simple dislocation? Complex being when it's a fracture dislo plus a dislocation. And then a simple one is when it's just a dislocation on its own. But the common classification that we usually talk about with, uh, it's uh, when you have anterior dislocation or posterior dislocation or inferior dislocation. Anterior dislocation is the most common, like I said, 95% of all uh, shoulder dislocation. That's when the head of humerus moves anterior to the glenoid. There are also subtypes of that. It can move anterior and just below the glenoid or it moves just below the caracoid or is sitting below the caracoid or is sitting below the clavicle. It can even go all the way to be in thoracic. But this is all anterior, so it is moving towards the ribs and sometimes into the ribs. Posterior dislocation is when it's moving away from the ribs. Usually, usual causes is electric shock and seizures. This is due to the strength imbalance in the rotator cuff muscles. And when this patient presents, usually they have an internal rotated and adducted uh, shoulder. So it can almost look like it's a normal shoulder. The rare one, which is uh, luxio erector, it's usually a patient who is falling and they hold onto something and the shoulder dislocate with the greater tuber tu the greater tuberosity sitting below the glenoid. So the arm is usually raised up. It's like hyper abduction. And this one has more complications because for that to happen, it means almost most of the ligaments and uh, the rotator cuff are ripped off almost entirely. So the picture up here is showing you uh, different types of dislocation that one can see. You can see the first one there, it's when everything is hunky-dory. And the second one, you can see the humeral head have moved anterior in relation to the lenoid. And the other thing you can see is it has moved towards the caracoid away from the acromion. The second picture, you can see the humeral head, humeral head has moved towards the acromium posterior or behind the glenoid fossa, which is away from the caracoid. And the last one is when it's an inferior glenoid and you can see the picture then, it has got severe complication when you have an inferior dislocation. So, 95% of all dislocations are anterior dislocations. So that is the subdivision of anterior dislocation. You can see subcaracoid where the head of humerus is sitting behind the, I mean, below or inferior to the caracoid. And this is the most commonest type of the anterior dislocation. It can also sit subclenoid, which almost look like an erector laxio. Difference is the arm is not hyper abducted. And then it can also sit uh, subclavicular when now it's actually moving further anterior. And then it can also sit intrathoracic. Rare, but it happens. In terms of how do you see a patient with a shoulder dislocation? So if a patient present and you suspect the patient's got a shoulder dislocation from the presentation, usually the first thing to do will be to, to take good uh, history of the patient, find out if there was any history of trauma that happened, including motor car accident, abuse, assault, GBV, anything, and then look for history of chronic illness will especially diseases like epilepsy and then ask if they've had any previous dislocation especially in patients younger than 20 years 
and if they have any surgery done on their shoulder before. Then when you look at the patient, the posture and attitude of the limb can actually give you whether the patient is dislocated or not. If the patient is holding the arm slightly abducted and externally rotated, it's most likely an anterior dislocation. If it's adducted and internally rotated, most likely it's a posterior dislocation. If the patient comes with the arm raised up in the sky, it's an a subclenoid uh, dislocation. And then important part is you have to look at a patient in total. Just because you have a shoulder dislocation does not exclude the other system having injury, especially in if with a history of trauma. So the patient must be seen in totality. And then neurovascular examination of the patient. Usually it's it will be minimal that you will do. It's usually deferred. You do it after you've done the reduction. And usually the axillary nerve is the one that is mostly uh, injured. And vascular assessment is important to look for distal pulses. And if you can't find them, even use Doppler to find those pulses. Vascular injury is rare, but is, it happens in, in shoulder dislocation, especially anterior shoulder dislocation. The important part about the neurovascular is once you have reduced the shoulder, re-examine the nerves and re-examine the blood supply and see if there's a change. And then uh, when the shoulder is reduced, stable, unstable, you decide, and then you can do your rotator cuff examination. But if you, it's an unstable one, usually the rotator cuff examination is done radiologically. Usually an MRI is more preferred, but in the absence of an MRI, a sauna is also can be used. So this is a guy with an anterior shoulder dislocation. You can see slight abduction of the humeral of the arm, and you can see the external rotation with the arm going that way. And uh, when you look anterior here, you can see the humeral head is actually subclavicular as compared to the other side. This is a patient with uh, most likely a posterior dislocation. There is no fullness on the anterior side, but the arm is internally rotated and adducted. This patient came to hospital with the arm raised up. So this is a subclenoid uh, dislocation. Once you have suspected your shoulder dislocation, usually with clinical exam, you can reach a diagnosis, but uh, to confirm it, the, the investigation of choice is your x-rays. And your AP and your lateral view x-rays are usually sufficient in making diagnosis of a dislocation. You, there are other x-ray views to do, but that's usually to diagnose other thing other than a dislocation. And uh, once you have reduced and you want to look, or if reduction is difficult, you can evaluate with an MRI or a CT scan to see what is blocking it, something like a bunkard lesion or a hill sac lesion. So you look at your labrum and the structures around. <clears throat> Uh, sona, where the MRI is not available, sona is it can play a very good role. It has user dependency to it, but it's just as good as an MRI. So this is a picture of an X-ray, an AP X-ray of a shoulder. So when you look at an X-ray, you have to look at the structures around it. The first important thing you want to see is your humeral head, followed by a glenoid are they articulating? In this case, they are articulating. Then you can also look at the structure around. That's your clenoid and that's your humerus. And then that's your acromioclavicular joint. That will be your acromion and then caracoid and clavicle. Then you have your, then that's the scapula. So this will be a an AP X-ray. That's the picture that you see when it's normal. And this is a lateral picture when it's normal. So what you see is you can see your caracoid already, and then you can see your acromion, and you can see your clavicle, and you can see your AC joint. 
and then the scapula in this case it goes down as a blade we call it the scapula blade then uh, next then you can draw a line you can draw a circle there that circle that i drew it's representing the humeral head the humeral head is actually sitting there then you can draw a line from the acromium and also from the caracoid and they meet uh in the middle of the humeral head and you draw also a line going down the scapular blade so if you take that picture out it looked like a if you look at that mercedes benz sign if you turn it upside down it actually looked like this so this is called an inverted uh mercedes benz sign which shows you where the humeral head is in relation to your scapula or your glenoid and uh if you remember the first x-ray we saw and then you look at this one what you can see on this x-ray is there's your glenoid and there's your humeral head and you can see the humeral head is not articulating with the with the glenoid and this is a lateral picture where you can see your humeral head is it's over there whereas your glenoid is far away and in this case what you can see now is that the, this is your acrom the caracoid and this is your acromion the humeral head have moved towards the caracoid so this is an anterior dislocation that's what i'm talking about so the head has moved it was supposed to be in in here and now it's there and then you have your posterior dislocation this is still a lateral view what you can see again is the humeral head was supposed to be sitting there articulating with the glenoid which is in the middle there but it has moved towards the acromion so this is how you see a posterior dislocation so to decide whether a dislocation is anterior or posterior you use your lateral view well that is not a rule of thumb though because you can still use your a uh, ap view to see if it's a posterior dislocation in this case that's where you see something called the light bulb sign normally the humeral head has it kind of have a little curve and it points towards the glenoid but when you have a posterior dislocation it actually sits facing the the articular side is now facing posterior and it actually look like a light bulb that will the other things that you can see when you're doing an x-ray you can see if there are any associated fractures something like a bony bank cut you can see fractures of your acromion fractures of your caracoid clavicle those fractures can be seen and then you can also see a health search lesion which usually you see it if you don't have a ct scan mri facility you can do what they call a striker notch view you can see bank lesion usually you see them with a worst point axillary view and then you can also see deformities if the patient is at uh, congenital or acquired deformities you can see them on the x-ray and you can see if there's any ac joint separation and you can also see the type of uh, chromium that the patient has so the associated pathology like things that usually also happen with a dislocation is you get your rotator cuff injury that's common in the older patients the younger patients get a dislocation plus a fracture the reason for that is in younger patient the rotator cuff is stronger in older patient the rotator cuff is weaker so the weak the weakest link become the rotator cuff in older patient the weakest link become the uh, bone in patients like teenagers going up in younger patient like those who still have the growth plate open they usually get a salter harris type of injury rather than a dislocation 
but it can happen. Uh, in terms of NIF damage, 9 to 63% of dislocation can, like you can get axillary nerve in 9 to 63%. Uh, subscapularis uh, injury in 29%, musculocutaneous nerve injury in 19%, 22% radial head and ulna nerve 8%. So the commonest nerve that get injured is uh, your axillary nerve. And then uh, you can also get brachial plexus injury and also vascular injury. In terms of bone, you can get a heel sac lesion. So a heel circulation is when you have a fracture or a compression fracture of your humeral head. Usually when the head is dislocating anterior or posterior, the head goes and hit against the, the corner of the glenoid causing a depression and that's a bunk lesion. I mean, sorry, that's a heel circulation. The other thing that happened when the head is dislocating, mostly anterior again, the the clenoid when the head of humerus goes down it actually either destroy your labrum or it actually cause fracture of your glenoid and that will be called a bunker lesion you can also have other fractures of your greater tuberosity or a valve usually a valsian fracture which evolves with your rotator cuff there's something called the terrible triad of the shoulder where you have an anterior dislocation together with a rotator cuff injury and a brachial plexus injury. Now this becomes a nightmare because examining a shoulder of somebody with brachial plexus is difficult. So you won't be able to know much about the rotator cuff and examining the brachial plexus of somebody with rotator cuff is also a nightmare. So yeah, terrible try. That's uh, just some advanced investigations that's uh, an MRI showing you a bunk lesion on the top picture there. And then this one, you can see a heel circulation where there's a compression fracture of your humeral head. This one you can, oh, so that's an x-ray showing you a fracture on the inferior part of the glenoid. So this head was out and then it relocated and then the fracture was left there. So the chances of this um reduce, I mean, dislocating again is very high because there's no sleeve covering there. So that's a bunk lesion, a bony bunk So in terms of how do you manage a shoulder dislocation? So once the patient comes and uh, you've done your examination and you have done your investigation, you are 99.99% convinced it's a dislocation. The, the important part of it is you have to reduce the dislocation. This location is an emergency. And there are various many methods of reducing uh, dislocation. The important part is to find that that works for you. And if usually it can be done under sedation in a casualty setting, sometimes if it's difficult, the patient can be taken to theater, still done under sedation or under anesthesia. If you have failed with reduction, then usually an open reduction can be done. So surgical treatment is usually for when there is failed reduction or, and if you suspect there are other things that you need to repair. The commonest method used, it's your Hippocratic method, where you put your foot inside the shoulder of the patient with your big toe facing towards the humeral head. So while you're pulling onto the arm, your big toe is pushing the arm, the yeah, the proximal arm laterally then it reduces. Then there are all these other methods that you can use. Like really the idea is to find that that works for you. There's your Stimson, your Koha, your Milch, and pretty much many, many methods. So what complications can one get by having a, a shoulder dislocation? 
be it reduced or be it not reduced, you can get stiffness of your shoulder. Usually, if you have had a shoulder dislocation plus other structure injured like your labrum or your, your, your rotator cuff, or if you have had a shoulder dislocation that required open reduction, that usually can lead to stiffness. Like I said, below the age of 20 years, you have a very high chance of getting a dislocation. If you dislocate after 40, yeah, about 15 or so, chance that you will get a dislocation, a re-dislocation. So a reoccurrence can happen. You can also get uh, your post-traumatic arthritis of the joint, you can get adhesive capsulitis, and you can get uh, your dislocation may lead to anterior subluxation or caracoid impingement. And don't forget your axillary nerve and the other nerves also because they can be dis they can be injured by the dislocation or they can be injured by the reduction. Usually when you're using your Hippocratic method, you might be pressing on the nerve. So this, this was from the South African Orthopedic Journal where they were checking the complicated shoulder dislocation in adults. And what they concluded was the important thing to do is to make an early and accurate diagnosis. Once you've made an accurate diagnosis, you are most likely going to end up doing the right treatment. Problem comes when it's either missed or the diagnosis is incorrect. That goes mostly for your posterior dislocation. It's usually mixed, missed. And uh, once it's missed, then the treatment will not be given. But if you have a high index of suspicion and you make an early and accurate diagnosis, then either you can refer the patient to the relevant person or you can start the relevant treatment. So in conclusion, shoulder dislocation is a common uh, condition. It's, it's half of uh, all dislocations in the body are actually of major joint are actually shoulder. And of those 95% of shoulder dislocation are anterior dislocation, which is very common. And it has a classical picture. When you see it, you'll probably never really forget about it. The younger the patient, when they get the first uh, dislocation, the higher the chance that they will actually get a redislocation once they are reduced. And uh, like the study said, the earlier and the more accurate the diagnosis is better, then you do the reduction, then the patient has got better prognosis. So in patients where it's purely a dislocation, they usually reduce and is stable. They put in a arm sling for about three to four weeks. And then you can investigate them or you can re-examine them after that. Uh, that's usually apply more for patients in areas where most of the investigations are not available. Uh, and that is my conclusion. Wait, am I? Hello? No, no, you. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I, I thought you were going to talk about uh, No, we're still here. We're following you. We, we saw you putting up the references. I thought maybe you wanted to say something about those references. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, quite practical and uh, one of the uh, quite common conditions that, as you said, uh, right, really so, that it's a condition that one might meet in a primary healthcare setting, and one needs to know how to deal with it. But we've got people like you uh, that colleagues can refer to, uh, those who need to do so. And you've given us practical knowledge about how, what to do when you face this situation and how to diagnose and identify these cases. I think what's also wonderful to know, it's uh, not wonderful actually, but I think what to note is, is that the, it, it affects the younger people. Well, I suppose it's because they're quite robust and active and those who participate in active sports uh, will do so. We'll, 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 we may end up getting this uh, condition. There's a, uh, one of the participants here was just posted, uh, maybe before we, we, we go there, 
I just uh, uh, we, we switch off your video uh, because it does not show your face completely. If you want to adjust it and maybe reset it, then you can see your face if you so wish. You on I think on out on your mobile. That's what you. you know, it's it's been it was switched off earlier on because it does not showing your full picture. For you, so if you want to do it, you you may do so. Ah, uh, it's yeah. still disabled. Yeah, you, I don't know. Well, it doesn't show at all. Maybe, oh, no, the other one, I think it is, maybe not this yeah, one. Yeah, the, the one on this the one mobile is just, uh, still maybe. disabled. Is it? Maybe if you try the other one, I don't know which one you were using. Okay, there was one just, just showing your, your hands. But in any case, as you adjust that, but if you, if you can't fix it, that's okay. There's a question from uh, someone who's, who's a, an, an engineer, Pumutso Matiba, uh, electrical engineer, uh, super uh, awesome presentation talk. And so the question is, I'm a runner myself, and how prone am I to shoulder dislocations while running, and can the shoulder dislocation heal by itself? And if so, what is the estimated recovery period after a dislocated shoulder? Uh, second question related to that is, you mentioned that one of the causes of shoulder dislocation is non-trauma, uh, that's electrocution. How does that happen and how much of the damage uh, that, that can be caused? I don't know if you want to uh, respond to these two questions. Okay, uh, as for the first one, in terms of runners, uh, running itself is not a risk factor for getting shoulder dislocation. But of course, runners fall quite a lot. And when you fall, the first thing you're gonna do is to protect your vital organs, your head and your chest. So you put your arms out and that can lead to dislocations. That's probably what will happen. But in terms of running itself, it's, it's not a, dis a risk factor for dislocations. Now in terms of uh, treatment of shoulder dislocation in runners, it's, it's pretty much the same as in everybody else. And the, how long it takes depend on what other structures are involved. If it's a pew dislocation where the shoulder went out and not much soft tissues or bones are fractured or injured, once it's reduced in three to four weeks, you start having uh, your exercises to restore your normal function and with good physiotherapists you can go back to normal shoulder function now also what's important is the age that you are in less than 20 years again of age when the dislocation happened chances are you will get every dislocation and when you have that usually you end up with a recurrent shoulder dislocation or shoulder instability and that now becomes some need like a uh, bigger treatment now you're gonna need like some bigger operations which is story for another day. Uh, what was the second question? Yeah, the, the second question was, uh, you mentioned that one of the cause of shoulder dislocation is not trauma. And I think you put it yeah. electrocution in, in other words. How, how does that happen and how much of a so, damage uh, can be caused uh, following that so injury? Again, going back to that uh, initial picture that I showed, the shoulder is, uh, the glenoid, it's very shallow. The head is actually big compared to the glenoid. So mm -hmm. the stability of the shoulder, it's usually mostly done by the other structures around the shoulder, like your rotator cuff muscles and, and your deltoid muscles, your trape trapezius, your brachioradialis. So it's the muscles that cause the stability. Now, if, when you are fitting, usually your muscles are going into spasm. They're contracting without relaxing and they can contract so bad that they pull the humeral head out of the glenoid. And usually it's a posterior dislocation that happened. The same thing, it's the same thing that happened when you are being electrocuted by electricity, you go into this spasm that is 
relentless and, elect and electroconvulsive therapy is the same. So it's the hyperspasm or the hyper contractility of the muscles that end up pulling the, the humeral head out of the glenoid. I hope I answered that one. No, no, thanks for the response, Dr. Yeah. You wanted to continue? No, I, unless he has yeah. more questions. No, no, Dr. wants to find out, with, with regards to reduction methods, does the type of uh, dislocation matter when choosing a method? Uh, that is, can you still use the same method for the anterior and both anterior and both posterior dislocations? Like this, that's actually a brilliant question. Majority of yeah. the methods that are described, your Hippocratic, your Koha, your Milch, and many others, you know, like many, many of them, they are for anterior dislocation, which 95% of the cases, it's actually the one that happened. So majority of the cases of the, dis the relocating method are for anterior. For posterior dislocation, the, the reduction method is a little bit slightly different. You actually have to externally rotate and push the and ex force externally rotation and push the uh, arm into anterior. It's I don't think it has a name for it, but it's it's a bit different compared to the ones of anterior dislocation. Yeah. yeah just, just before I go to the next question, I, I could be old fashioned, maybe it, it, it exposes my, you, you know, if a patient comes through to you, you know, GP practice, or maybe you out there in the field, what, what can one do just when you would identify this could be a shoulder dislocation? Uh, is there anything uh, that one can do immediately to reduce pain and maybe, or can you even, even attempt a reduction in a non uh, you know, hospital setting or uh, pos is that possible? Or is that uh, been recommended? Um, it's a, it's both a yes and a no. The, the yes part is, it, it depends on where you are. If you're in an area where medical health is not gonna be available in a long period of time. Like you're gonna go hours before the patient can get to a hospital or a health facility. In that case, attempting a reduction will be ideal. But again, the, the, it has to be somebody who at least have a bit of an idea. You can decide whether it's an anterior or a posterior because you, you can't just pull. It's the, the reduction is really not pulling or pushing. It's it's got a method to it. So if you can see, I mean, if it's a doctor Bila, I mm. will think he will probably reduce. But if it's somebody who is a, how did he say, an electrical engineer, I think rather try get transport and get the patient to a hospital where he can get proper. Because by attempting reduction without much knowledge, you might be causing more harm. Things like maybe there is a fracture that is undisplaced, you can displace it. Or there's rotator cuff injuries, you might be finishing them up. Or there's nerve injury, you might injure those. So for non-medical people, I think it's a no-no to attempt unless they know what they're doing or they've had first aid. But for medical people, I think by all means, because early reduction is good. Okay. Where does the figure of eight fit? Uh, figure of eight was used to treat clavicle fractures. Mm. The, the idea was to actually, you are pushing the shoulders back, you are abduct, you're pushing the shoulders back so the clavicle fracture can align. Again, even for clavicle fractures, mm. it is not recommended anymore. If it's a fracture that's going to okay. be treated conservative, an arm sling is quite sufficient. So figure of eight is gone. Okay. 
Yeah. Well, sorry, I, I, I lost you there because I'm not sure if you are you still there? No. I'm still here. Yeah, no, I lost you a little bit momentarily there. So I was the VR of eight is something that you mentioned. Don't you? No, it should not be used anymore. Okay, thanks. Uh, Oscar Shimani wants to know, uh, well presented, uh, please comment on the role of post-reduction physiotherapists. Uh, any roles for physiotherapists once the, the your, your patient has been to, to, been to a orthopedic surgeon, they've done reduction, what does they, is there a role for a, a physiotherapist oh, there? 100%, I think they are the most important people once their shoulder is reduced. First, uh, once it's reduced, obviously they will check if there are associated injuries and then the associated injuries will be dealt with, whether it's surgical or non-surgical. And then the physiotherapist comes in terms of uh, regaining the function of the shoulder. And uh, most of the time, suppose it's a, it, it was just a dislocation and no other injuries. Usually three to four weeks, you send them to physiotherapy so they can start with uh, the whole range of motion and strengthening the muscles around. And it actually does reduce the chances of re redislocation. Okay. So it's very okay. important. Okay. Yeah, next question from uh, yeah, your friend, Dr. Mtengu. Uh, what is the incidence of, well, says, thank you very much for such wonderful and informative, informative presentation. What, what is the incidence of shoulder dislocation uh, with associated tendon or ligament injury? Uh, because many patients with shoulder dislocations often complain of limited shoulder movement. movements. Okay. Uh, in terms of tendon, there's not much tendon around the shoulder. You have your bicep, long hair of bicep tendon, but uh, mostly what you find that is injured around the shoulder, it's your rotator cuff muscles, which some people can call tendon, but it's more muscle than tendon. So those are injured. And uh, I think the, one of the few last slides was talking about the complications that happen. If you have an injury to your rotator cuff or because uh, also your capsule is injured, you can get things like adhesive capsulitis, you can get frozen shoulder, that will be the reduced uh, shoulder function that you find mostly post reduction of shoulder dislocation. And this is where physio is very, very important. I think all patients that have had shoulder dislocation, once they are reduced and they are stable, they should be referred to physiotherapist. It will reduce this uh, stiffness that Bongan is talking about. Okay. You've got a Nevondo here. Uh, let's really? say Nevondo. <laughs> you know who it is. Hi, wife. <laughs> and, and nice that you get support from home. <laughs> uh, say, thank you for the presentation. It was a lovely clinical refresher course uh, for some of us. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, Dr. Mashiro wants to know what, what will be systematic approach uh, to non clinician, uh, to a non clinician confronted with shoulder dislocation. Uh, yeah, I think we spoke about that question with the elder facility being very distant. We, we, the we the approach on will be one, organized transport. And then uh, usually, when you have it dislocated, it will be in a certain attitude. Like, say it's an anterior dislocation, the shoulder will be sitting slightly adducted and externally rotated. Do not try and force it into internal rotation or more external rotation. Rather support it in that position until the patient gets to a hospital because that will be actually the most comfortable or the less, least uh, painful position for the patient. Yeah, so sure. it's to keep that attitude that the patient is in while you're seeking for to get them to that distant uh, facility. Yeah, no, no thanks. I think that's much too good. And then Muteo, uh, Randani Muteo one, uh, wants to know, after the reduction of three weeks of uh, immobilization, should it be complete immobilization that this patient wearing the arm sling 
uh, 24 hours a day to prevent occurrence, was it safe to remove when going to bed and uh, to resume mobilization? Uh, should it uh, be gradual or should it be just monitored to continuously? Okay, if it's a simple dislocation, no associated structured injury. Usually it's it's an arm sling really that you, you wear. So it's a simple immobilization. It's not full immobilization. So you do allow some movement. Patient can take the arm sling out and bath and as they just need to avoid some type of action depending on what the dislocation was. If it was a posterior dislocation, for instance, they should avoid excessive internal rotation and things like push-ups and stuff like that. If it's an anterior, they should avoid excessive external rotation and abduction, but it's not full mobilization. When it's a dislocation plus other structures injured, usually there will be a whole um, algorithm on how to go with it, like a, a rotator cuff, depending on which one it is, you will have the algorithm for that, a labrum repair, you'll have an algorithm for that. So that becomes a little bit deeper. That's when you actually put the, like in the posterior dislocation, there are even different type of arm slings that you can wear. There's an arm sling that actually keep the arm abducted. So yeah, I hope I answered that one. No, thank you very much. I don't see further questions. Uh, unless there's someone who wants to just maybe ask a question and unmute themselves and then they can ask a question. Okay, this uh, last uh, one from Dr. Indai Mudaung. How does one know the difference between a severe shoulder subluxation and a dislocation, especially in, uh, I think it's CV patients, CVI patients, adversely in CV patients? I'll, I'll, I'll literally answer this by answering the difference between a subluxation and a dislocation. Okay. So the glenoid, in fact, this applies to any joint. So when you have a joint, you have two bones that are meeting in, in one place. If the joint, the bones move, but there's still some contact between the bone, that's a subluxation. If there's complete the articular side are completely not touching. That's a dislocation. Uh, there is not much, there's no something called severe uh, subluxation. It's either you are subluxed or you're dislocated. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nivonda. I don't see any uh, more questions. It has been a wonderful presentation and a quite a practical way of, of, of doing it, uh, of maybe managing this condition. And I think, uh, thank you for showing us the different ways, uh, different uh, ways this condition can occur. And I think the clarification also that, you know, these are more, 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 more muscle than, than, uh, than ligaments uh, that we are talking about. And um, uh, that patients who are much younger, they are most likely uh, to, you know, they are getting much at an earlier age, they are most, most likely to get their recurrence. And I think people who are much older like us should avoid getting it. Uh, but the good news is that even if you get it, you're not likely to get it again. Uh, and, but sports in general, is, uh, people who play sports quite more uh, because of the, the robust and the, a, a physical game that they, they play. I mean, we've been showing us pictures of rugby players and also soccer players. Those are the ones who are uh, most likely to, uh, to get it. Uh, but at least we know where to go to. Uh, your colleagues who are here, uh, they know uh, that we, we've got people like you uh, in our facilities and anybody stays who's in, around the Phoenix Health Group facilities. Maybe, maybe you can explain because you, you work with a, it's not only you alone, you work with a team of other sorts of clinic surgeons. Maybe just share a little bit about that. Uh, in the, in the hospitals that you work at and maybe the kind okay, of uh, um, services that you do there, yeah. Okay, I work in in private. I work solely in clinics, hospitals. Uh, it's, they are located in Fort Lawrence in, there's two in Soweto, which is SK Matzeke and September. And there's also one in Van Park. 
and then there's also a day hospital in town. And uh, the orthopedic surgeons, uh, there's all the hospitals, there's more than three or say orthopedic surgeons that work there. But in terms of me, I also work with Dr. Hadeve and Dr. Mailana, where we formed a consortium. And the reason for that is just so we can have many days to see patients so patients don't walk in and find there's no orthopedic surgeon in the hospital that we work in but i think most conditions are covered they are shoulder surgeon specialists like in sk mazeke you have dr chauke and uh they are arthroplasty which we all do and they are spine surgeons you can find and i think in terms of clinics we are covering majority of the cases that are there in terms of orthopedic surgeon and where we not able to, which is rare, we will get you somebody. Thanks. Yeah, so we, we've got a good coverage in terms of orthopedics, uh, stage and uh, all types of uh, uh, interventions that uh, you know, a team that you're working with and we're quite uh, uh, grateful for that. And we know that we, we, we are able to offer the services that uh, most of the patients who need the orthopedic surgeons can Receive within clinics healthcare group, and thanks and thank you very much Paul for the presentation and thanks for honoring the invitation once more and to come and to, to share your knowledge and uh, experience and the ex expertise that you have uh, as an surgeon. Uh, and we just want to thank uh, Mrs. Novonda who was here also <laughs> part of, who, who joined here too to be part of the team. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank yeah, I'm sure we'll, we'll also want to hear from her one day. I suspect that she's in the, in the field also. And also to thank the marketing team that is uh, always here to, and before the marketing team, to thank everyone, everyone who's been coming, colleagues who've been joining in every week uh, to listen to the colleagues who are joining us. And thanks to the marketing team and all those who are uh, part of Clinics Health Group to make sure that we have a, a weekly programs. And we hope to see you again next week and have a good evening. Thank you, Dr. Bela. And